Hello, my name is Robert Brem, and welcome to another in a series of lectures about themes dealing with philosophy, political theory, and psychology. Uh, we are going to be continuing a number of these, as you've probably already seen a few that have, we've already posted. But these are designed to enhance our relationship with one another as you interact with material that I present online. So in this very first principle of embodied philosophy, we want to look at the question of what is good. And that's a very difficult question. In everything we do, whether it is at the personal or psychological level as a person, in an organizational life as a worker or an entrepreneur, or in society as a citizen or policymaker, a driving question is, what shall be done? What should be done? What do we need to do to make a preferable future vision more probable than merely and only possible? Futurist Barbara Marx Hubbard and philosopher Francis Moore LePay note in all of our actions, in each moment of decision, our choices and the consequences of those choices engages us in a collective act of conscious evolution. Our collective human actions create the future in which we all shall live. And since the future is where we're going to spend the rest of our lives, maybe we should take care to think deeply about the things we think we think about before choosing what shall be done. As it strikes me, Envisioning and creating the future we want, seeking to call it forth, as some might say, is as if a magical spell. And it is a principle in spell casting that to speak a sloppy spell is to do sloppy magic and therefore create sloppy results, a sloppy reality. And we've got to live with that. That is to say, I think the quality of one's inquiry, thinking, and willingness to commit to the highest degree of integrity in clarity and critical thinking goes hand in hand with spiritual integrity and the integrity of social movements committed to changing the world for the better. However, behind all of this, in our vision of a preferable future story of self and a story of us in a better future story of now is a crucial question which is not so simple in finding an adequate answer and that is the question of what is good. Until we answer the question of what is good we cannot decide on any course of action as to what shall be done. Against that standard of what we say is good we decide what it is that is a good choice here and now. If philosophy and psychology are crucial to the search for a good life and which choices we have to make day to day that will serve us in creating such a good life, if politics and culture is about the search for and the creation of a good society, then which courses of action or policies will make better the probability of that future vision coming true? What is important to note, however, is there is no empirical standard of what is good for anything we might choose as persons, workers, or citizens. No standard that every human being everywhere would agree to. There are a lot of answers from each culture, and within these cultures there's a conservative version, a more liberal version, a more radical variation of these answers. How do we choose from all those possible answers? In many cases, people have fought and killed people over their answer of what is the good society or the good life. And that's not a very, very functional way to live. And I doubt most people would like to live in a future filled with constant warfare over whose version of the truth is going to uh, dominate. So we can draw on some answers from multiple thinkers, including the work of Aldo Leopold, M. Scott Peck, Carl Rogers, from the field of psychotherapy, eco-philosophy, political theory, to seek answers to this question, how do we determine what is moral and ethical behavior, what is good policy, what is the good society going to look like? So, granting that there are so many truths about anything offered by so many different traditions, let alone what is and is not good, and also granting that when we do seem to decide on one course of action or one definition of a good, we really ought to consider the proposition there are no singular truths. There's no singular truths woven into the fabric of the cosmos. And seeking to engage in moral judgments often hurts 
in interpersonal relating, more often than not, I mean, when people feel like they're being morally judged, they turn off. And if our goal is to create a more open and accessible society and more healthy relationships with one another, then we shouldn't be engaging in moral judgments. So one interpretation of Western civilization's story of the fall from paradise is that when humans, in their imperfection, believe they could judge what is good and evil, humans kick themselves out of paradise. That had they simply lived in flow with life, accepting the world as it is, not how we want it to be, and then worked within those constraints to create a better future for ourselves, then maybe we would have lived closer to paradise. Yet, we can't go to one religion for a definitive answer either. There are just too many religions. Then there is the matter of the historical record of all the people killing each other over their versions of religion. So that doesn't actually work very well, does it? So how do we choose a good course of action that avoids the pitfalls of moral judgment? Therefore, we must find our own way to answers in making these choices. All beliefs, values, morality, and ethics are contextually relative to the situation in which we find ourselves located in space, the place we live, and time, here. The reality of the human condition offers us few other options than to make choices within the bounded rationality and the resultant ambiguities of the human condition and human relationships and events. Upon these grounds, then, we must act in the lived and shared world of day-to-day -day experience and interaction that results in the emergence of social reality. This reality emerges in the complex interactions of being human, <laughs> being human, day-to-day, -day, where we live and act as persons, as workers, and as citizens. People frame their answers to the challenges or problems in living, and they make their choices in their day-to-day -day lives out in the real conversational universe, interacting with one another and creating social reality. And to enable us to function effectively in this context, humans seek to live or function from within roughly three different worldviews or perceptual frames of reference as an integral part of each of our own personality structures. Our story of self, our identity, is how we relate to the world. In this way, we define ourselves and our society in this process and is driven by some definition of good. These classical worldviews, which you can find in every culture, some variation, a comparable or a commensurable structure of a worldview that functions roughly the same. There's a conservative worldview that values order, centered and grounded in the traditions of the past, which sustain and bind us together as a community, our story of us. There's a liberal worldview that values liberty for the individual in the pursuit of self-defined happiness in the present. And there's a radical worldview valuing equity and equality such that we may in our actions create a more just community in the future. Each of these worldviews frames common values in a de facto different language about the nature of good, about the nature of everything actually. People as individuals perceiving, thinking, and communicating through these worldviews literally think and speak in a different language. That's why so often it seems like we can't communicate with one another. We're talking past one another. So learning to anticipate that no one has the right answer, but maybe everyone has a part of the answer, allows us to actively listen to one another and not morally judge them as right or wrong, but as different, and that together we create a new reality. And in this context, when it comes down to it, practically and functionally speaking, what is good becomes a kind of choice or preference. Liberal freedom to choose, liberal, liberal freedom to choose, and the conservative responsibility for the choices you make and the choices from which you choose, and how you interpret the meanings you attribute to your interpretations of concepts such as morality and ethics and values. This is the radical aspect of this dynamic. So how do we choose to act in a good way? And against which standard of good do we assess a good life or a good society? Then it is the consequences of our choices and our actions, which we look at when we are saying, this is good. Like it or not, it is our responsibility to choose. Eric Fromm noted that we fear this freedom because it also leaves us 
with no one to blame. We chose our choice, but we also chose the choices from which we choose. And that's scary because in the end, if it fails, we're to blame. But if it succeeds, that's empowerment. And that is what real freedom really is. Yet here we are, we must choose. So we can explore this question through a series of propositions that of necessity must begin with the proposition that it is preferable to exist and be alive than not to exist and not be alive. You'd be surprised that's actually not something that everyone would agree to. <laughs> of course, if one does not accept this proposition, then everything else we discuss from this moment on is irrelevant. But if we do accept this proposition that being alive is better than not being alive, then psychologically, biologically speaking, it is preferable to have a healthy life than to have an unhealthy life. Again, if you do not accept this second proposition, all else in this discussion is probably irrelevant. However, if we grant these two propositions, if we do accept the proposition, then from these we are able to construct a series of propositions leading to a conclusion as to how we may arrive at moral decision making using disciplined informed inquiry and without regard to mysticism, dogma, or mere opinion. Therefore, the argument proceeds as follows. What may be defined as good is that which enhances the prospect for humans to live in a healthy fashion biologically and psychologically. If what enhances life in this fashion is good, then what diminishes life in these terms is morally unacceptable, or anything that diminishes the prospect for humans to live in a healthy fashion biologically and psychologically is a bad choice. Apply that principle to almost everything and you'll find it probably works that this is bad because it's unhealthy, this is good because it is healthy. However, it can be proposed that a healthy, self-reflective person who wishes to live beyond merely surviving, in fact, seeking to thrive and meaningfully pursue happiness, would grant these first two propositions. Therefore, what enhances the capacity for life to survive and thrive, biologically and psychologically, is proposed here as being our standard of good for all our choices as persons, as workers, and as citizens. And we define what is healthy and this is what's interesting. We define what is healthy using the reliable working facts from the findings of the various behavioral and medical health sciences. So we actually do know what is healthy. Overall, then we can call this the life ethic. The life ethic. In, it then follows that there are certain ways of ordering society in a manner that enhances the capacity of life to survive and thrive in a biologically and psychologically healthy fashion. And these can be differentiated from ways of ordering society that diminish life and enhance life prospects for everyone to a lesser degree. Further, we can then reliably say any such social order modality would be the optimum or good and best social order in the context of this healthy life enhancing perspective. The life ethic can also be proposed or proposes that there is evidence that democratic values driven social order is one in which our interactions with one another are defined by the boundaries of democratic values and that such a way of being enhances the life prospect to the highest degree of success. This is a democratic social order. A democratic social order is proposed as a good society and such a good society is best, most effective at enabling each citizen as persons to move fully towards the pursuit of happiness or a good life within the boundaries of democratic values which involve the right to be free, which always means the right to be different and the capacity to speak with your own authentic voice as to who you want to be. It is also proposed then that any social order that is not democratic is not an optimal social order in engaging the capacity of people to pursue the good life in that it diminishes the life prospect of the people within the system. On this basis, it is possible to determine the morality of a given course of action as a person in your personal psychological life, as a worker in the organizational world, or as a citizen or policymaker in the larger political and cultural world. And so as they say in logical argument, quad erat demonstrandum, which is that which is to be demonstrated. I offer this life ethic as a way to engage in choices 
to create a better life and a better society. In future discussions, we will explore some of the details of what that will look like and other philosophical, philosophical concepts that help us engage in this sort of uh, thinking and action. But until then, my name is Robert Brem, and good day and good luck. <laughs>